Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 190 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at wireless charging and seeing what's happened recently in that sphere. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to thank everyone who listened to the recent charger pricing episode and pointed out the error in the narrative. I did, of course, say Tesla's market capitalization was three quarters of a billion dollars, when I meant three quarters of a trillion dollars. I had a couple of Tesla investors writing me quite worried comments on social media wanting to know if I was trying to short the stock for personal gain. Alas, no, it was a typo in my research. Apologies. Our main topic of discussion today is wireless or induction charging. This is where the transfer of an electric current from a power source into a car's battery is accomplished without physically connecting the car to the power source via a cable. The underlying tech is well established. I mean, most modern cars come with wireless phone charging built in, so it's nothing new. It just wasn't widespread tech at a larger vehicle size scale. Back in, ooh, way back in episode 70, we discussed wireless charging. At that point, it was something that people were interested in doing. It was something about which people saw the benefit. It was also something that wasn't really implemented in any great detail. Fast forward a few years and we find that wireless charging is something that people are interested in doing. It's something about which people see the benefit and it's something that isn't really implemented in any great great detail. In other words, on the surface, it looks like something that hasn't moved on a great deal. Well, I'm here to tell you that's right, but not entirely. Today's episode looks at wireless or induction charging in both the public and private sphere, and we chat with Hevo, who have one of the first wireless charging offerings for destination charging. I'd like to welcome Thomas Armstrong from Hevo to the show. Welcome, Thomas. Hey, Gary. Thanks for having me. Could you introduce yourself, your role, and tell the listeners how you came to the electric vehicle sphere? What's your origin story? Yeah, absolutely. So I joined Hevo about eight months ago, and Hevo is an electric vehicle charging company based in Brooklyn, New York, in the United States. We create wireless charging for electric vehicles, which is an incredible technology that a number of folks have been working on for about 20 years, but is now really ready to be commercialized and really ready to be put in vehicles that you and I drive. So I joined Hevo after a number of years in consulting. I had primarily focused on trying to modernize our grid. You may hear of high voltage transmission lines or advanced distribution management systems or how we handle distributed energy and demand response and these sorts of programs at a utility level or a municipal level. That's where I spent the beginning of my career. And so I was excited to move into more of the consumer facing and start to deal with vehicles and vehicle habits, charging habits, understand what works well or doesn't work well with our current EV charging infrastructure and work for a company that I think has a better solution. And Hevo solution can be truly hands-free charging that you can even operate via an app on your phone. And that has incredible benefits for a number of users like you and me. And it certainly has a number of economic benefits for our commercial customers. So I'm excited to tell you more about that today, Gary. We'll certainly come back and cover that uh, a little bit later on. But I want to look back to something that you started with there. Induction charging as a technology, pretty much like fuel cell technology in, in vehicles, it's been something, it's something that's been around for quite a few years, but it doesn't really seem to have made the leap into the mainstream. Why is that? It's a good question. There's been a number of companies that have worked on it for a long time. Kivo ourselves has been around since 2011 spending a number of years trying to perfect the technology of magnetic resonance. How do we pass electricity from a pad on the ground into your vehicle? And how do we make that as efficient as plug-in and as cost viable and commercially viable as plug-in? 
And that took an incredible amount of time and effort. And luckily for me, I've joined at a point where Hevo and other companies have figured a lot of that tech out. But um, part of the reason it took so long is just because of advances in science and advances in materials and going through a number of pilots, some of which were successful and some of which were really painful to understand how to improve in the technology and how to improve on all aspects of integrating that technology with the vehicle and how to train users on how to use it. And so a number of companies, including Evo, have had great successes and great failures and are now at a position where we're seeing the demand from fleets. We're seeing the demand from automakers, car manufacturers that we work with to start to provide this as a service or as a product in electric vehicles moving forward. So it's a, it's a really exciting inflection point where companies have now passed this R&D and this trial and this pilot phase and are ready to get to true volume production of this technology. Friend of the podcast and former guest, Sam Clark, who is the Chief Vehicle Officer at Grid Server, a huge charge point operator here in the UK. He's on record as saying that he thinks that induction charging is, I think his quote is, ridiculously expensive, at mm -hmm. least at fleet level. There's the cost of groundworks to install the chargers, the cost to OEMs to add induction pads to their cars, all the cost of third-party induction chargers, the depreciation loss when selling a vehicle that's had a, an induction charger fitted, insurance premium impacts due to modifying cars, issues with understanding payment processing, etc. How accurate are his concerns? I think historically very accurate. And there are a number of companies that tried particularly at higher power levels, maybe semi-dynamic or dynamic charging, which is where you can charge your car as it drives. And some of those pilot programs years and years ago cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the user experience was relatively poor. The, the communication and the project management with local utilities and automakers and fleets and all the partners involved was incredibly complex. And now we're at a point where we really feel like we've solved a lot of those challenges. I don't want to overpromise that we've solved all of them, but we're in a position where we know what it takes to build one of these units. We understand what the cost is in terms of our production. We understand what the cost is in terms of installation. And we have the ecosystem of partners who have done this before, who are now ready to replicate this project, whether it's in the United States or the UK or elsewhere in the world. And at this point at, in Hevo's history, we have projects across the world. We have customers in the United States, Mexico, UK, India, South Korea, Australia. We've done this with different people at different power levels for different customers and use cases. We know what it takes or we know what it doesn't take. And so those lessons, I think, have really prepared us well. But historically, 10 years ago, when, when we were starting out and many other companies were starting out, I would tend to agree with them. But I think we're at a different point in terms of the maturity of the technology and in terms of the maturity of the companies involved and the partners involved. All right. We'll come back in a few seconds to some of the things that you talked about there. But before we do that, just here's kind of your opportunity for the sales pitch. Talk to me about the Hevo offering. What are you providing and to whom? Thanks for that opportunity, Gary. <laughs> so we, we provide level two charging. Typically in the United States, that's around eight kilowatts. I know in the UK, Gary, that's typically around 11 kilowatts, but we provide level two charging that can be both wireless and plug-in. And we're the only company in the world that we know of that has that product that can do both. So Gary, let's say that you have a car that's enabled for wireless, but your kid or your partner has a car that is not. Our system is compatible with both. And that's an incredible offering to really future-proof, as we call it, your EV charging experience as vehicles go from being plug-in only to plug-in plus wireless to eventually wireless. The other thing is we have a product that has performance that's on par with plug-in charging. So typically with plug-in charging, depending on whether you have AC input or DC input, that could be whether you plug it in to the wall socket or whether you're connected to a battery pack or rooftop solar or something else, you're typically getting around 92 to 96 percent efficiency in terms of the electricity that's coming in from that power source into your vehicle, we've gotten to the point where our technology is comparable in efficiency. So you can now get wireless charging at the same efficiency. That means we can power your car at the same speed, at the same energy price, 
there's really comparable performance. And then the final thing that I would say is the price. Uh, we are at a point at Hevo where we have a path to high volume production for a price point that's comparable with what you'd spend to get a plug-in charger today. So in home applications, that's going to be around $1,500 to $2,500. In commercial applications, that could be between $2,500 and $5,000 for that level two charging. And so if I could tell you that you could have wired headphones or wireless headphones and they'd cost the same and work the same, you'd be inclined to get the wireless headphones. And that's been proven out for headphones and toothbrushes and a number of different consumer applications. We're at the point where we can do that with vehicles in a way that plug-in companies certainly can't and many of our competitors on the wireless side certainly can't. And, and we see a huge market to answer the second part of your question. In the United States alone, we believe there's going to be 30 million EV chargers. There's a lot of data from McKinsey and IEV and a number of sources to back that up. About 10% of that will be wireless. And so that's 3 million units alone in the United States. And the United States, frankly, even though we're based here, we have a great relationship with a number of states and government entities in the United States. That's our smallest market because Europe and so many other regions of the world are five to 10 years ahead of this journey in transitioning to electric vehicles. So there's a multi-billion dollar opportunity for us with wireless charging. We're starting with these early adopters, and that's on the commercial side. That's primarily for us logistics fleets. Think about last mile delivery vans from Amazon or FedEx, customers like that. It's also transit. That could be buses, that could be school buses, that could be taxis, but any of these transit vehicles are early adopters of wireless. And then the third is accessibility. That's for elderly drivers, that's for disabled drivers, that's for anyone with a mobility challenge where plugging in the car is really difficult. It's really untenable, actually. And wireless is going to give them an opportunity to own and operate an EV potentially for the first time. So those are early adopters. We're already selling to those customers. Those are the customers that we have in many parts of the world that I just mentioned. Over time, we'll move into mass adoption, and that'll likely start with luxury and sport brands and then eventually move into all passenger brands. So that's our commercial evolution over the next three to five years. Hopefully when we get to the end of that three to five year evolution, then the types of cars that you and I might buy, your generic Ford or Stellantis or Nissan or whatever it might be, will be enabled for wireless as an option. In the same way that your vehicle has the option for OnStar or a moonroof or heated seats. So what exactly is a home customer getting when they pay the $1,500? Are they getting are they getting a pad that sits on their driveway? Are they getting something that's embedded into the ground that needs groundworks? Are they getting the associated hardware that needs to be installed in the vehicle? What, what are you actually providing? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So we're providing both the ground equipment, sometimes called the ground assembly, and the vehicle assembly. So for a homeowner, let's say that you wanted to purchase wireless charging, we would sell you the ground equipment that would go on your street, in your garage, uh, wherever the appropriate application is, given whether you live in a, a single family home or an apartment complex or whatever it might be. We have a number of installation partners who handle that installation and maintenance for us. We work with a great company in the UK called Car Charged UK that handles that for us. We work with a company called VIA, V-E-H-Y-A, in the United States that handles our installations, Pastiche in India. So we have a number of these partners who are going to take our Hevo product, act as Hevo, and help you install and maintain that equipment in your home. And that's really a pad that goes on the ground. And that pad can be on top of the ground, it can be flush with the ground, or it can be under the ground. And in any of those applications, we can maintain that high efficiency that I was mentioning earlier in the recording. On the vehicle side, we would work with the automaker to upfit your vehicle with that vehicle assembly, that vehicle equipment. And that equipment is allowing you to receive the electricity from the ground pad and input it into the battery of your vehicle. So we don't want to do that 
to the earlier criticism of wireless charging, we don't want to hack that on, so to speak. We want to work with your automaker to do that. And in some of these early adopter cases that I mentioned, these last mile delivery, for instance, we're going to work to upfit the vehicles that they have so that we can deploy this as soon as possible. If it's a homeowner in a few years and you want to go out and buy a Stellantis vehicle or another type of vehicle, you'll be able to buy that vehicle from the dealership or online or however you purchase a vehicle, and that'll come with wireless. So you don't have to worry about installing that yourself or maintaining that yourself or anything else. It'll be like the powertrain or the tires or the steering wheel or any other element of the car that comes with the car and then is included in the warranty and able to be maintained by the automaker and their dealerships. Let's just hone in a little bit on the Stellantis there. Uh, you announced a partnership with Stellantis um, back end of last year, I believe, to provide wireless charging for their vehicles. Now, I read the press release on that and it, it was quite light on details. What's the nature of that partnership? You talked there about adding or, or giving them the, the hardware uh, to include into the vehicles or almost as a, as well, actually as an OAM offering. Does that mean it's, it's proprietary hardware for you and it will only work with your wireless charging systems or, or what? What's the, what's the detail behind that? We're actually trying to create a world where the opposite is true, where it is entirely interoperable. So you might be familiar with Tesla superchargers and how originally they were exclusive. You couldn't use them unless you had a Tesla. So if you pulled up in a Nissan Leaf or a Rivian RT1 or any of these other vehicles, you couldn't use a Tesla supercharger station. We want to create a network that is open and that is interoperable and interoperable in the sense that you can use our equipment with different makes and models, but also interoperable in the sense that you can use our equipment with other wireless charging companies' equipment. You could have our vehicle pad and use that with somebody else's ground pad, and those two would be interoperable. And I think what surprises a number of people is that there's about two dozen standards out there by the Society of Automotive Engineers that detail how wireless charging should work. Everything from the power electronics of it to the communications, to the interoperability, to the electromagnetic fields, all the different elements of this technology are actually set in standards. And if we can comply with those standards, automakers can comply with those standards, and our fellow wireless charging companies can do as well, then we can create that interoperable world. So that, that's answered to, to one of your questions. To speak to Stellantis, Stellantis has been a great partner to us. We've been working with them for over two years at this point, and it's primarily on two distinct projects. The first is on how we can communicate between our equipment and the vehicle. And we're trying to apply these Society of Automotive standards, Society of Automotive Engineers, I should say, standards for how that communication happens. And for your technical listeners, they'll be interested in all the details of communications over the CAN bus and things like that. But for your kind of general users, we're concerned with how does our technology interact with the vehicle? If the vehicle says, I need X amount of power, we need to be able to provide X amount of power. If they say, I need X amount of current, we need to provide that. If they say start or they say stop, we need to be able to re react to those commands. So our work with Stellantis is to apply those communication standards to a Chrysler Pacifica, to one of their, their electric vehicle models and really set that as the standard that can then be applied to all the different Stellantis brands that use that same EV platform. So whether you have a Jeep or a Maserati or a Fiat or any of the different models that come with Stellantis, you can apply this same standard. And our technology will work with any of those different kinds of, of cars. The second project is working on a higher power application. Typically, Hevo focuses on that level two market, that eight to 11 kilowatt range. That's about 90% of the EV charging market. But a number of customers are interested in higher power, particularly as you start to get into different public uses or medium or heavy duty applications, heavy duty vehicles, things like big trucks and drayage and other things. They're interested in higher power and Stellantis is as well. So we work with them in partnership with Oak Ridge National Labs as part of the Department of Energy to develop a 50 kilowatt wireless charger 
that has some really interesting proprietary technology around its power density and some other elements that make it really powerful, but the same size and the same sort of mechanics as that level two solution. So we're working with Stellantis on both of those things we have for many years. The press release was just kind of a simple acknowledgement of that, but there's a lot of work that's happening behind the scenes to get to a point where uh, in the coming years, if you buy a Jeep or you buy a Fiat or you buy some of the brand, it can be compatible with our wireless charging. The big question that jumps out of what you've just said there is, why are you having to do all this work with Stellantis? Because you, you made a statement a couple of times, which is all the standards are out there. So if all the standards are out there and you're providing hardware to that standard, why are you not the same as Brembo who make brakes? Stellantis don't work with Brembo. Stellantis buy the hardware and stick mm -hmm. it on their cars. What, what's the additional added value that you're giving with that? Or what's the additional added value that Stellantis are getting with the partnership with you? So Stellantis is one of the first automakers to actually commit to applying those standards to their EV platform. So a lot of what we're doing, Gary, is we're doing this for the first time with a major automaker. Some other automakers have piloted it. If you Google wireless charging with BMW and Porsche and some others, you can see some pilot projects. This is the first time that an automaker has said, we want to build our platform to these standards. We want to try out these communication protocols. We want to explore different power levels. We want to figure out how we can get this into all of our vehicles. So the reason that we're doing this kind of upfront R&D or development work with them is because it's the first time that it's really happened at this scale. Moving forward, whether it's with one of the other Stellantis brands or it's another car company or something like that, there's a real opportunity to, I won't say rinse and repeat, but certainly accelerate this work. And then we can, to your earlier point, we can become a supplier just like anybody else. People sell tires to car companies. We sell wireless charging to car companies and we become a tier one supplier to them selling our equipment. They buy it, they install it, they plug it in and it works right away. And so we're excited to get there soon, but th this is really the first time that we've done it with Stellantis. So there's been an upfront work to really set this industry, really lead this industry for many of the other automakers in the world. I want to move on a little bit now to talk about the non residential aspect of this. I think I heard you say there that something like 90% of the target market is going to be individuals who own cars and they're going to be using induction charging in their own driveways. So the 10% that's not in there, and I think you mentioned uh, fleets and, and things like that. Tell me a little bit more about them. Absolutely. So just one clarification, 90% of the charging that's out there will be level two typically overnight charging. But that's a mix between fleets and home and workplace and retail and a number of different locations. So it's not necessarily that 90% will happen at home. It's that 90% will be at that overnight charging power level, that eight to 11 kilowatts range. But in terms of some of the fleets that we work with and, and where we focus on, it's really those logistics, transit and accessibility applications, and then to provide charging for them. And so we would provide the wireless charging of those vans, but then also make that charging available to the public. So we're going to place them in places like Target and Walmart and some other areas. That fleet can wirelessly charge at night, but if you or I were to go to Target during the day and shop at Target, we could also use that charger. And we'll provide the wireless and the plug as another option for those customers. So that's a really exciting project. We're looking at ways to replicate that project around the world. And that's in addition to the number of projects that we've worked on for disabled customers, providing them with a mobility solution, and also with logistics and transit and some others. So in the case where a member of the public comes into a target car park and uses the wireless charger, what's the billing process? How, how does that all work and fit together? To just, because obviously, or presumably, this isn't going to be free. So Gary, it's a great question about, about the billing. So there's a few different options for how this can work. One option is a revenue share, and that can either be on a transaction basis, meaning 
every time you charge your vehicle, X percentage of that goes to Hevo, X percentage goes to Target, X percentage goes to all the different players involved. The other is, is a more advanced evolution. You see Tesla moving in this direction. We'd like to move in this direction in the coming years as we mature and grow as a company is more of a charge as a service where you pay X amount per month or per year. And that includes financing for the hardware and also for the charging. So theoretically, you pay $29.99 a month. As part of that, you get access to the hardware, to the technology, but you also get your charging included. And so we're, we're excited to work with the Targets and the Walmarts and some of these other partners that, that we hope to be able to talk about publicly and, and really create those models and apply those models, not just in New York, but in all the countries and cities that we work in. Break that down into a little bit more detail. If I, you know, I'm driving my Chrysler, whatever, and I park it over uh, an induction plate in a Target car park, how do I physically start that going, start that charge, and make sure that it gets charged to the the right account? Is this the induction charging equivalent of plug and charge? There's something set up on the the VIN number of the car, or do I actually have to swipe a card somewhere? Is there an app to start it, or what? what's the proposal? So let me start with how it works today, and then I'll give kind of an insight into how we think it's going to work in the future. So today we provide a software platform called Journey, and you can get that on the Apple Store or the Android Store. Through that app, you can start your charging sessions, and that's going to store all your vehicle information, your account information, your payment preferences, it's going to give you route planning and route optimization and many of the things that you have seen as part of existing charging apps. The thing that it also provides that's really exciting and unlike plug-in is you can remotely operate the charging session from your phone. So if I had a vehicle in the United Kingdom and I was here in New York, I could actually go and I could remotely charge that car. So this, this software is incredibly powerful, but in the payment case, you'd be able to identify one of the chargers that you wanted to drive to. You could click on that charger, set the optimal route to that charger. And then when you get there, being able to reserve it, to schedule it, to start that charging session, and then ultimately pay for it. And all that can be done through your mobile app and through your mobile wallet. In the long run, what we want to do is provide customers with some more optionality. And that includes having that journey software included in the car included in the instrument cluster, or the HMI, or I know there's a number of different terms for it, but in almost like that iPad screen in your vehicle. And you'll be able to map yourself to an EV charger, start the session, stop the session, handle payment, all that within the vehicle. We've had some companies license our software for that reason. I can't tell you the, the names of those companies, but we've had companies that are interested in that have tried that out. And we're in a number of conversations with automakers to figure out how do we do that integration in some of the later models that are coming out in the next few years. One other possibility is to have RFID and NFC and other payment methods where you could go up to the charger and you could tap and you could pay. So again, what we offer today is that app-based, but we know that people want different solutions, whether that's customers, whether that's automakers, they're all going to want their own thing. So we want to be able to serve those different options and provide both that in-vehicle option as well as more of the tap and pay option. And under that scenario, would the charging experience be owned by Hevo or would it be owned by a third-party charge point operator? It could be either. Our, our goal is to have that operated by us as a charge point operator. Uh, but we certainly had conversations with the Electrify Americas of the world to figure out how do we integrate? How do we provide our hardware and our software to them? What does that look like? Is it still under the Hevo label? Is it white labeled as Electrify America or something else? So a lot of those conversations are going on. Uh, I can't really predict what will happen with those, Gary, but it's certainly something that's on the table. Looping back to one of the statements I made at the beginning, uh, as I said, friend of the podcast, um, Sam Clark and his uh, objections to induction charging. One of the things that he also brought up, and I think this is a, a common thing that was an issue the last time I looked at induction charging, was the fact that if you don't have the apparatus on the vehicle and the pad perfectly aligned, you get less than optimal efficiency. Is that still the case? And if so, how are you solving that issue? 
you do not have to be perfectly aligned. There's some allowance for misalignment, and that's on the x-axis, the y-axis, and then the z-axis. So whether you have vehicles of different shapes and sizes, whether you pulled in a little slightly to the left or the right or too far forward or too far back, the system can still operate and it can almost tune itself to make sure that it's having the optimal charging experience depending on where you're aligned. Those SAE standards that I mentioned earlier, Gary, that sets the minimum efficiency at 85%. And so if you are so far misaligned, which I can tell you having done this many, many times, we have thousands of hours of, of charging on our systems in the world. It's pretty hard to get that far askew, <laughs> um, but it's certainly possible. If you do get that far askew, the system will ask you to realign. And we provide the alignment guide both in your mobile app and the vehicle, but also on the LED screen of the charger to show you where you are in relation to that pad on the ground. So to Sam's concern, don't worry if you're three inches to the left or you got a small car or a big car, things like that. A number of those challenges have been addressed. Now, if you have one tire on the pad and half the car is totally off, we're going to ask you to reset. That makes sense. So let me just clarify or clear up, make sure that I understand this. The 85% uh, efficiency is what you could expect regardless of how misaligned the pad and the, uh, the charger are, providing the app or whatever has said you are quote unquote aligned. So you don't have to be 100% perfect to get the 85% efficiency. And if you're not going to get the 85% efficiency, the system will say, we're not going to charge, you need to realign. That's right. And typically if you are anywhere close to the center of the pad, uh, which is going to happen anytime you're going to use it, honestly, you're going to be more like 91 to 95% efficient. And that's the range that we typically see with our system. 91% if we're connected to a wall socket, a 208, 240 volt typical kind of plug-in. We get closer to 95 when we have DC input from rooftop solar or batteries or things like that. So that's typically the range that we're operating in. But yes, that minimum is 85. And if you are way far off, we'll ask you to realign. Talk to me about induction charging and vehicle to grid. Is this a thing? It's very much a thing. It's something that Hevo is actively working on. It's how to magnetically resonate the, the power from the ground into the vehicle, but then to do that in reverse and be able to wirelessly take that power from the vehicle and put it back into the grid or into another energy source. That is something that almost everybody is asking for. There's even a recent bill in California to make that a mandate, not just for wireless charging, but all EV charging to have that be bi-directional. So it's something that we're actively working on. Some of the other companies working on wireless charging have products that are capable of bi-directional charging, and it's very, very powerful. There's certainly the economic impact of it, the amount of money that folks can make without having to plug in their vehicles. You could be at work, your car could not be plugged in, you could be on vacation, and you can participate in these different utility or municipal programs for V to G, V to X, demand response. There's a number of different programs and buzzwords out there, but all an opportunity for you to use your car as a power source and to generate revenue based on that power source. So there's certainly the, the personal or the business financial implications of that technology. There's also the societal benefits of that technology and the ability to connect your vehicle and batteries and the grid and microgrids and all these different sources as a way to diversify the assets that grid operators have at their disposal for balancing load, for handling emergency situations, hot days, hurricanes, anything that's at play, your vehicle and what it's connected to is another source for that. And so there, there's both that economic benefit that's driving people to ask for that technology, and then there's a the societal benefit. So it's very much on our roadmap. We're planning on releasing a product next year that is closer to that 25 to 50 kilowatt range that has bi-directional charging. And we have a number of customers that are, are eagerly awaiting that product release. What's your verdict on the Swedish project that was announced recently where they're looking at electrifying a stretch of road to charge cars as they drive? Those projects are fantastic. That, that's also in our roadmap. That's a long way out from being something that you're going to see every day. But 
the the power of it, maybe that's a bad word, but the the impact of it is remarkable. If you can get to a point where people never have to stop and charge, particularly for trucks, particularly for logistics, some of these larger vehicles, it's saving time, it's saving money, it's saving infrastructure. A stretch of road that's powered with wireless charging. Even though you'd think, well, this must be super expensive because I have to pat, put these pads in the ground and I have to dig up the road and I have to connect it to battery source and all these things. The work to do that is actually less expensive than the equivalent of DCFC supercharging that you have on a highway. And that's because of the amount of power that you can generate from these wireless charging pads. So for instance, for about every mile of wireless charging, you can get about eight to 10 miles of range. So if you put this in a couple mile stretches on highways or busy avenues or intersections, things like that, you can generate a tremendous amount of power for these vehicles. That cost is gonna be significantly less than putting these very, very expensive DCFC stations every couple exits. I think a lot of people don't realize how expensive it is to install these systems, these Tesla superchargers or some of the other ones that are offered, they're hundreds of thousands of dollars to build these units. Whether it's the units or the canopies or the cooling stations or all these things, there's a ton of infrastructure. And with wireless charging, there's just simply less material. It's almost like a coil that goes in the ground that's connected to a power source. So it will take a while to get into the mainstream, to get on I-95 or I-40 or major routes in Europe and Asia and elsewhere. But that is the holy grail. That, that is what everyone is really working towards in terms of public charging, is to get to a point where it's dynamic. You never have to stop and charge. And if that's true, you're really addressing anything related to range anxiety. You never have concerns about that. And car manufacturers are able to provide smaller and lighter and cheaper batteries. You're able to really reduce the cost of the vehicle. And so that, that's where many of us want to get to, a lot of us want to get to, and there's sort of a, a race among a number of countries, a number of research labs, a number of companies like ours to get there as soon as possible with the best product. Final question, slightly contentious. Uh, and don't take this personally. I was at the fully charged show recently in the UK and I asked their marketing manager if Hevo had, had exhibited at any of the North American shows they've held. And they've held a couple out in Austin and San Diego. He told me, no, he'd never heard of you. Now, if you're not attending the world's largest EV and renewables exhibition, are you really serious about this? We've taken the approach of keeping relatively quiet. And that doesn't mean that we don't invest in marketing and we don't spend time interacting with partners and news and, and other outlets, but we're really heads down on developing our product. We think we have the best product out there in the market. And there will be time for splashy news and splashy demonstrations. And we intend on attending a number of events in the coming months and years, but we're really focused on getting the right product for customers. Uh, Thomas, thank you very much for your time. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Gary. Thanks for having me. A couple of takeaways from this discussion. There have been lots of pilot projects, etc., around induction charging. Some early solutions were expensive and didn't deliver. Evil claim they've sorted these issues and now have a working, scalable offering. Vehicle to grid through induction charging is a thing. This is good because it sorts out a lot of peak grid issues and it's good for electricity supply regardless of how it happens. Charging is a minimum of 85% efficient with figures in the high 90s if the car is positioned perfectly over the induction charging pad. Tom mentioned a lot of the different wireless charging standards that are out there. And now since we recorded this discussion, the field has moved on a little bit. There's now a defined set of standards for wireless charging known as ISO 19363, which quote, defines the requirements of operation of the onboard vehicle equipment that enables magnetic field wireless power transfer for traction battery charging of electric vehicles. It is intended to be used for passenger cars and light duty vehicles, end quote. Since conducting this interview, I've also spoken with representatives from Witricity, or Witricity, uh, who are a European-based induction charging company. They echoed a lot of what Tom said in his interview, uh, specifically about the efficiency of wireless charging. I also saw an example of their wireless charging tech in action. 
If you check my socials, you see I visit a new charging hub at the Navuno headquarters outside Bath recently. They had both Hevo and Vitricity solutions there, and they both look pretty awesome. So this is going beyond the realm of we think this can happen into we've actually got this happening. How long before you can get a complete solution for your home and how much that will cost is yet to be determined. But my thanks anyway to Tom for his time. I think this is a topic we might come back to in the future just to check on progress. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. British supermarket chain Tesco has announced receiving its 500th electric van. It will run home deliveries for the company's Sheffield Extra Store, making it the first in Yorkshire to have a fully electric fleet. The Sheffield branch runs 14 electric vans, making 2,500 deliveries to customers' homes each week. The 500 electric vans in the fleet today form only a part of Tesco's total fleet of 5,500 home delivery vans, delivering to 150,000 customers across the UK daily. Moving the whole UK fleet to green electric power would be the equivalent of taking 22,000 cars off the road each year. The company reportedly works with EO Charging to install corresponding infrastructure at its depots or depots to charge its own electric vans. As an ex-grocery delivery driver who spent 18 months delivering in a diesel Mercedes Sprinter, this is really good news. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by Zapmap the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps that EV driver search, plan, and pay for their charging. ZapMap is free to download and use, with subscription plans for enhanced features, such as using ZapMap in-car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingsEV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash EV Musings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash EV Musings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've got an electric is available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, you've gone renewable, is also available on Amazon for the same 99p, and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at MusingCV with the words, no wires, just magic. Hashtag, if you know, you know, nothing else. Thanks, as always, to my co-founder Simon. You know, I once asked him if he'd like to see a planet where we had rampant fossil fuel burning, but enough carbon capture tech to completely remove the offending stuff from the atmosphere. We wouldn't need to worry about stopping burning stuff and we could all continue as normal with no issues. He didn't seem too keen. He told me, We're actually trying to create a world where the opposite is true. Thanks for listening. Bye.